Just me to introduce uh, Agent Wang, which is um, um, a challenge for me primarily because I don't know him very well and I'm embarrassed by the fact that I don't because he is superbly accomplished and a particularly important member of our department. Um, his current uh, title, as it's shown on one of these slides, I think is Associate Professor in Surgery and Vice Chair for Translational Research and Innovation. I think it's also remarkable that he's associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, which probably adds to my chagrin because that was my undergraduate degree, biomedical engineering. And I thought I was going to do that as my lab, my, not my lab, but the lab I was working and developed the first fiber optics that went on to make all the fiber optic scopes for all the labs. I remember melting glasses of different density and stringing fibers of glass surrounded by other glass of different density to transmit light and thinking, well, this was cool. We could probably do something with this. I don't know what. Of course, we're not to make scopes. They maybe should have stuck with that. That might have been a better idea. But <laughs> nonetheless, uh, Dr. Wang uh, hails from China originally, did all of his uh, what we would call undergraduate training and a master's degree in China uh, in bio, uh, pharmacology and biochemistry and biology related issues. Ended up in the United States um, uh, in the um, uh, in the 2008 at Berkeley, where he was a postdoc fellow in the Department of Bioengineering. Kept on with that group until he uh, joined the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine in 2010, and then subsequently came here where he and Dr. Farmer have developed the remarkable lab on tissue engineering using stem cells in an attempt to close spina bifida. Has remarkably over $10 million in uh, grants uh, that have uh, helped support his career and that of many others. And so I think we're very honored and pleased to have him and give a summary grand rounds today. Agent, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to the audience uh, from the Zoom room. So it's uh, my great pleasure to give a presentation to you all today. Uh, on our research progr program at the Surgical Bioengineering Lab. So I'd like to uh, start off with a disclaimer. I'm a co-founder of uh, VisoBio Inc., which has a license to the uh, peptide LXW7 technology I'm going to talk about. So before I start with anything else, I'd like to uh, put my acknowledgments slide here because what I'm presenting today is really a a huge amount of work that has been done by a very talented, uh, growing, actually, team of uh, scientists in my lab. Uh, and especially with the uh, great uh, acknowledgement to Dr. Farmer uh, as a co-director of the surgical, surgical bioengineering lab with me. And also, there are many, many of our colleagues surgical in, in our surgery department who have uh, helped and collaborated with me and the lab. And in addition to our internal uh, collaborators, I also have listed a few uh, external outside of a department collaborators who have made a huge contribution to our research program here, including a faculty member from our stem cell program, from our uh, biomedical engineering department, our vet school, our Shrenos Hospital for Pediatric Research Center, and also our uh, biochemistry department uh, uh, at all. So, uh, so my presentation, I like to give this presentation, I, I know now with COVID actually, we, we are able to get probably more people who can attend to this seminar. I actually, so I think I'm hoping with this presentation, more of our trainees and also our junior lab mem uh, faculty members and even any other faculty member who are interested in research and get to know a little bit more about the lab at Surgical Bioengineering Lab, what we do, what we can offer, and uh, especially for training, and see what we can really offer to the trainees to get to know more about uh, surgical innovation and how we can combine bioengineering, surgical bioengineering with surgical uh, uh, applications. So the overarching goal of the lab really is to bring bioengineering to surgery. It sounds like uh, two very irrelevant uh, topics, but actually, as Dr. Djokovic mentioned, you know, lots of biomedical engineering or engineering at large technologies can be very well utilized to improve uh, uh, patient care, especially surgical uh, innovations. So in my lab, we're focused on three things, and essentially come into one thing. 
So we are interested in stem cells. We're interested in stem cell derived extracellular, extracellular vesicles, or we call them EVs, and also extracellular matrices, extracellular matrix molecules. So by combining all these three, or sometimes two of them together, we are hoping to de develop innovative treatments for surgical conditions and diseases for translational applications. So in the past several years, actually, we've been very fortunate to be funded by the federal government for, from different uh, institutes of uh, an, uh, NIH Institute and also NSF. Currently, actually, we have two active R1s and we have R21, we had an R3, and also we had a grant with uh, California uh, Innovation or uh, UCCAI, so Center for Accelerated Innovation, I guess, and also several other grants from NIH and NSF. So we have also been fortunate enough to get lots of funding actually from CERM to develop our stem cell product, product uh, for spina bifida and also some other uh, funding agency from the state, for example, TRDRP program to develop uh, technologies to treat uh, vascular diseases. We also have received grants from Shiner's Hospital. I'd like to acknowledge that too because this has been very tremendously helpful for the team to keep the focus on pediatric diseases for many of our lab members. And, and also, uh, so uh, overall, actually, with all these uh, funding support, our team has been able to develop several pretty remark remarkable technologies. So I'd like to highlight a few today. But if you want to know more, please visit our lab website if you search uh, my name or a surgical bioengineering lab uh, at UC Davis, you're going to see more information about the lab and ongoing projects. So as I mentioned, we have three major research directions actually in the lab. One is stem cells and gene therapy. This is actually a pretty large part of the lab, but I'm not hey, going to focus. Hey. So I'm, but I'm not going to focus on that part. So for EVs, extracellular vesicles, and ECMs, I'm, I think this is relatively new, both of these two topics. I'd like to give a little bit more introduction to these and get to more information about how we potentially can use these for surgical diseases. So for example, EVs, they are not particles secreted by cells or stem cells or any cells. And they are actually are a very powerful tool for drug delivery. And because they're so small, they can actually cross blood-brain barrier, for example, for certain applications is quite important. And they can also be engineered because they have uh, membranes, they have content inside. I'll give a little bit more information later. So for extracellular matrices, actually, this is very closely relevant to biomaterials, scaffold, and also medical devices because how the body and tissues and cells are interacting with the environment, uh, the extracellular matrices are playing a huge role in modulating the interactions. So I would just very quick go through the stem cell stuff because I think you have, you must have learned, like heard about it from somewhere. We have lots of trainees who have presented, we have faculty who have presented, I have presented before in, on that topic too. So generally speaking, I just want to give you what we have in the lab, some information about that, so you, you know if you need anything about stem cells, come find us. We have lots of stem cells from different sources. We also have stem cell products, for example, good manufacturing practice or GMP, clinical great stem cell. We have the protocol, how to do that. We have a very close collaboration with, with our stem cell program on campus with Dr. Jan Ota and uh, Gerhard Bauer and their team. And also, we, we have a pretty good amount of uh, engineering work about stem cells, too, how to improve the stem cell in survival, or how to functionalize them. So lots of good stuff about that. One good example, though, we, we have many others. So placenta, actually. We've been focused on placenta as a tissue source for stem cells for a long time now. We have established several different protocols to isolate stem cells from placenta tissue, even a very small biopsy of placenta, and we have identified several very unique properties of the, like, uh, uh, of these cells. So as I mentioned earlier, we actually have been focused on using stem cells for the treatment of uh, spina bifida, which has been approved by the FDA as a new IND, and actually Doug Farmer and the, our uh, division of pediatric surgery team uh, led by Dr. Shin Hiroshi actually are leading the clinical trial 
to test this new technology in the human trial uh, now. So on the same line, actually, I've, I've been leading another clinical trial from the vet school uh, uh, to look for a solution for a natural occurring disease model in English bulldogs. So it, those dogs are born with spina bifida, so they're different from the larger animal model that we use for research, for example, the sheep model or other animal models, they're surgically or chemically induced. These are naturally occurring, so we actually are currently ongoing, uh, having this clinical trial ongoing, testing the stem cell product for a postnatal patient in English bulldogs. So we'll, we're, we have made actually extremely uh, productive year over the COVID time actually, we enrolled several patients and I can give a separate talk on that topic someday. So today I'm gonna focus on these two things. One is extracellular vesicles or EVs for short or ECM. I would like to give you some information about how you can potentially use these for your practice too. So EVs are actually, they're very important. They are everywhere. They are secreted by all the type of cells. And they can be in either circulation as a free nanoparticles secreted by different cells, or they can be embedded in ECM, so in a tissue with the extracellular matrices. So they have the uh, surface proteins on the, on the out, outer side of the nanoparticles, which can interact directly with the ECM molecules, for example, collagen. They also have lots of good stuff inside, cargoes of uh, nuclear acids and proteins, especially microRNAs, which are really in interesting to our research program. So we're trying to actually understand, first of all, the biology of the, the uh, EVs, and especially the uh, th therapeutic potential of these EVs. For example, we know EVs are having uh, potentials for anti-apoptosis, migration and proliferation of the recipient cells and also pro-angiogenic functions and also anti-inflammatory functions too. So they're very versatile, they're very multifunctional. But how to use them very like effectively and establish them as a therapy is something we're really interested in. So in our own research actually, the past several years, we found that as if I if I give the talk about the stem cells for spina bifida, I would have to give you a, a video showing that with our stem cells, actually the lambs with spina bifida were able to uh, stand up and walk with the stem cell treatment. Compared with the control without stem cells, the lambs were not able to stand up and walk. And we later find out actually the stem cells are mediating neuroprotective functions. So the stem cells can protect neurons now we have the model in the dish showing that M PMSCs or placenta MSCs are able to rescue neurons from apoptosis. We also seeing this in small animal models too. But we also seeing that PMSCs and, or MSCs in, at large, they, after transplantation, they don't necessarily stay or stick around for a long time. But the effects or the functional outcome actually tend to stay long. So how, how, how is this happening? What's going on with this? We actually now is more fo we're more focusing in this area, which which is called MSC secretome. So, which means the cells are secreting lots of good stuff to the environment that can be carried forward even without the cells being there. The stuff is such as <coughs> excuse me, extracellular uh, vesicles and other uh, proteins and cytokines. They can actually be around for a long time, and especially EVs. So this is why we actually start look, uh, looking into uh, the application of EVs. By using EVs only, basically you collect the condition media, isolate the nanoparticles from the culture media. Actually, without using live cells, you can see that they, they, this is the control without using EVs, and this is a, uh, cells, neurons in, in apoptosis with EVs, you actually, or exosomes in this case, you can see that with the EV treatment, more neurons can be protected. This indicates that you probably don't need to use MSCs in some cases, and just using the MSC-derived EVs could have some neuroprotective functions. And then the key question now is that uh, with several other animal models actually ongoing right now, that we, we, we are asking a very critical question for development of the technology for clinical use how to get this enough and how to get this treatment more effective. So that's why we're actually interested in looking into how to get the cell culture condition to be, to be more, uh, be able to provide a higher yield 
and uh, large quantity of EVs, and also how to functionalize EVs and make them more effective in treatment. So this is one example that we've been looking into using different extracellular environments, including 3D biomaterial scaffolds or bioreactors, to look for ways of uh, expanding the cells so that we can have enough EVs. And also, we're looking for ways to control the quality of EVs so that be, they are more homogeneous rather than heterogeneous, so, which is a very important part of the uh, product development down the road. So we're also very interested in uh, engineering EVs to be targeting and also to improve their functional therapeutic uh, efficacy. So for example, you can actually imagine there are small cells, even though they're not live cells, they're small nanoparticles. You can engineer the surface with different ligands to target disease area or a specific type of cells. You can also engineer a scaffold to load extracellular vesicles or biomaterial or hydrogel to load extracellular vesicles to a local delivery uh, for a sustained delivery as well. Uh, ultimately, actually, you can actually synthesize EVs from scratch, from bottom up, using bottom up, bottom up scratch uh, approach to make your own EVs as you like. As you can imagine, you can actually use different technologies uh, to modify EVs for different applications. We, can, we have a lot to do. And we are having quite a few different projects about EV engineering right now. So this is one example, which I'm not going to talk about other applications today, but I think at one time I will tell you more about how EV engineering has been uh, done in our lab for different disease applications. We apply for a new R1 to the NIH actually by using the EV delivery system for providing a sustained uh, long-term neural protection for spina bifida. Actually, this proposal was reviewed very highly valued <laughs> valued and we got a first percentile actually by the study section and it's, it is funded as a R1 with the Dr. Farmer and myself as a PI. So we also, okay, now I'm going to give you a little bit uh, introduction to the extracellular uh, matrices because I have prepared quite some slides. I'm trying to run through them, but I think I'm, I'm doing good now. We have not time. So extracellular matrix actually is even also very important and interesting because this is closely relevant to medical devices that all our surgeons are dealing with almost on a daily basis because the cells, when you have a medical device implanted in vivo, the body and the cells will interfere directly with the medical device. And how the medical device is interacting with the body actually is, a, is something that we can learn from the native environment, how the ECM molecules are in, interacting with the body cells. So we're learning this from, uh, from several different ways. And also we're trying to develop ECM technologies uh, into uh, surgical technologies and uh, products. So we're interested in native ECMs. Basically, you can derive ECM from different tissue, uh, from human or from uh, animal tissues by decellarizing, uh, by functionalizing those ECM scaffold, make them into scaffold. There are several very successful clinical products. For example, small intestinal cell mucosa or other collagen products that are widely used in clinic uh, scenario, actually. We are also interested in deriving ECM uh, materials from different tissues for uh, specific applications. I'm not going to focus on that. So we also have these two technologies, which is, one is artificial ECM. So how to make the ECM to be more tissue function specific. This is something we can do by using bioengineering technologies. For example, you can use electric spinning, a technology to make nanofiber scaffold, which is uh, similar to the native ECM nanofibers. And you can also add different ligands to functionalize the ECM to mediate, it, uh, to mediate a specific cell uh, ECM interactions, to basically to modulate the recipient cell functions, for example, by uh, modulating binding and also uh, downstream signal pathways by having a specific molecule on your medical device surface. So one example uh, of the regulating pathways uh, for cell or tissue functions is the integrin-based ligands or integrin-based uh, pathways. So integrins are playing a huge role in mediating cell-cell interaction and also cell matrix interaction. So that's why we're interested in that. And also at different stages and different type of cells, 
they have different integral molecules. So by using a one bit one compound high through, throughput screening system, in collaborating with uh, Dr. Kit Lam from Biochemistry on campus here at UC Davis, we actually have been able to identify several ligands using this high throughput screening system to target specific stem cells. For example, we have uh, very much interest in uh, endothelial cells because endothelial cells are so important in, in vasculature, in everything about uh, healing and regeneration. We identified a ligand, I think I presented this previously, uh, this ligand actually so far has been shown very, very uh, potent in modulating endothelial cell binding and also the endothelial cell uh, surface receptor, VEGF receptor phosphorylation, which is a, a huge deal for the function of endothelial cells, and also endothelial cell proliferation. So basically, you can imagine having this ligand on the surface, the endothelial cells either being recruited from the body to the medical device surface or being transplanted by, by co-culture cells on the device ex vivo and then transplant in vivo. You can actually imagine the cells will be in a different status now with the exposure to this ligand. And we actually have shown that by having this ligand modification on the surface of a scaffold, you can significantly increase the cell binding to this medical device and also proliferation, lots of other good stuff. Another example, because we're interested in uh, mesenchymal stem cells, we know that mesenchymal stem cells are highly expressing alpha-4, beta-1 integrin. We also we actually have been testing a alpha-4 integrin uh, ligand LLP2A against our placenta MSCs. We are, we are seeing, and also activated T cells in some other uh, uh, scenario, actually they highly express alpha-4, beta-1. We are seeing that LLP2A actually is able to significantly, significantly improve MSC attachment and also uh, uh, function downstream with the uh, connected to uh, integrin alpha 4 beta 1. So by using this ligand, actually we can not only immobilize or improve MSC to attach, but also you can control the MSC derived EVs to a medical device. So as you can see in this slide, we develop a method to modify a artificial ECM surface with this ligand, and then you can demobilize MSC-derived EVs. So ultimately, we're making a device that is able to deliver MSC EVs on a local area and for sustained release. So I'm not gonna go deep on how we can use this, but actually we're having several applications around this technology right now in the lab. So we are also showing that with this immobilization technology, which can have the you know, circulating free EVs being immobilized on the medical device surface, we are showing that the uh, MSC EVs are able to maintain their functions after being immobilized on the surface of the medical devices. So a few other applications of the ligand technology and also potentially how to uh, motivate and also uh, recruit endogenous stem cells and also transplant stem cells, especially in the field progenitor cells, from uh, ex vivo to in vivo. So we're, we're using uh, several models uh, and disease actually very closely relevant to our surgical specialty. For example, vascular disease and uh, uh, transplant environment, for example, where uh, hemodialysis patients are requiring a vascular graft, for example, or vascular disease where patients re require a vascular graft. And also diabetic wound where it, it, the environment is very ischemic. And uh, so we, and also burn. So this is, I'm going, giving you a few slides about each cases, how we're using our new technology to modify the scaffold or medical devices that can be applied to these surgical applications. So let's start with the vascular graft. I'm going, I'm going to go through these uh, slides quickly because we have published several papers about this. So the idea for the vascular graft to improve the endothelialization and patency actually came from long back, long time back, because as you know from circulation, there are lots of stem cells. There are endothelial progenitor cells too, but how to effectively immobilize those cells or to capture those cells to your medical device surface to make them function or to become into a functional endothelium is a challenge. It's not easy because they're so rare. There are many other cells. So we have actually used this technology to capture 
this very rare population of endothelial progenitor cells, but not other cells. You know, there are many other cells that are showing similar properties, similar integrin expression on the surface. But this peptide technology actually we developed has been shown to be very specific to support endothelial progenitor cell binding and also downstream functions. So as you can see in this slide, we are basically making our own my, uh, small diameter vascular graph, which is actually a target for future use in uh, cardiac uh, or uh, coronary artery disease, for example. But of course, we can use this uh, uh, vascular graph for many other conditions. Uh, so we're using this animal, small animal model, rodent rat model of cardiac artery, which diameter actually is only about one millimeter. It's super small. And if you don't do anything for such a small diameter vascular graph, the surface will be clogged very quickly. But we are, I'm just going to show you very quickly about how our technology can change this. Because this is what we did. This X of 7 modified small diameter vascular graft. Actually, this is the X axis is the time point per week, one week to, until six weeks. You're seeing number of animals who can uh, still maintain the patency of the graft, maintain the opening of the graft. And as you can see here, many grafts without any modification, they're going to become clogged and blocked by the uh, thrombosis and many other uh, cells and tissues quickly. Actually, for example, you can see the blue line here. Within two weeks, actually, most of the grafts are clogged. But with this surface modification with this technology, you can see actually only one out of six is blocked. And five out of six actually stay open for this period of time. And from the histo historical analysis, you can actually see there are lots of endothelial cells. So showing here red is endothelial progenitor cells, and green is mature endothelial cells. And this is one week, the control graft, and this is one week, the coated graft. This is a six weeks of control graft. This is a six weeks of coated graft. So we can see that actually the coding technology can significantly improve endothelial cell binding and uh, endothelialization of the scaffold. And now we are actually transplanting this into the large animal model, and we have done a preliminary study. We're seeing that with the uh, X sub seven, we're, we're doing this in a AV graft, so where we uh, have the graft connected to the to the artery and vein in the pig model. We're seeing that with the coating, with this coating, actually you're 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 having a much better surface compared with without coating. This is the PTFE graft that we you use you really use in clinic. And at four weeks, actually, if you look at the luminal surface, you can see a lot of the cells or different stuff, different things are on, attached to the surface. On the untreated surface, you can see a lot of platelets and platelet aggregation and lots of red cells, these big pie-like shape uh, cells, there are red cells, a lot of platelets. But on the surface treated uh, graph with X7 technology, you can see a significant amount of endothelialization. All these cells actually are showing in by immunohistochemistry. They're actually having a mature endothelial cell marker C31 expression. So this is very exciting. But this is a major, like a bigger blood vessel. Can we use this technology to improve small blood vessels or vascularization for new tissue formation? So one use is a ischemic wound in diabetic wound. Very quick, I know all of you, most of you know much better about diabetic wound healing than me. Uh, there's a huge clinical need. So the key question here is that in this very super ischemic environment, how can we promote new vascularization? This is a key question. Whatever the strategy you can have, if you can motivate endothelial cells or endothelial progenitor cells to make better new vascularization, that's a win. So there are different strategies that have been explored in the past. For example, e endogenous EPC mobilization or different technologies to get EPC and the field progenitor cells to activate and to make more of them and become into functional uh, endothelial cells and vascularization. That has been studied and also transplantation of EPC from outside, expanding EPC and to the body. So, but still EPC survival actually in this super ischemic environment has been a challenge. Our technology, we're hoping to develop a technology based on this technology to, is to improve by binding, by providing a binding surface and stimulating the fuel cells. We're hoping that in the fuel cells can survive better and also can function better. We have this SIS scaffold that you know very well about, which has been used in clinic for 
diabetic wound healing and many other uh, cases. And in our spinal bifida research, dual replacement materials made by SIS. So we're using this clinical product. We're trying to modify the surface of SIS by using this DS Sidley XW7 technology. There's a lot of science behind this, but just to make it very simple for you to appreciate how this works, basically DS Sidley is a large sugar chain with many side chains and where you can have both X sub 7 which is uh, able to bind to endothelial cells, and also the silly peptide, which is able to bind to collagen. So essentially, we have a dual functional peptide that one hand of this uh, mo molecule can bind to the scaffold. The other hand of the molecule can actually bind to endothelial cells. So by using this technology, we're de developing a, a new product. Now, this SIS is functionalized with this peptide and then loaded with endothelial cells. And then I actually applied this into this uh, uh, diabetic wound uh, application. So in this case, we start with the, the rodent model. We're using this uh, Zucker fatty diabetic rat, which is very fat, as you can see in this picture. And they are actually having very uh, similar uh, physiology or pathology with human uh, diabetic uh, situation. And we're making this tissue flap models with like a four holes and two holes in the middle. Uh, having a a silicon membrane underneath, and then the hole actually is making the the uh, and the the cut from the square is making the blood supply from all almost all directions of being uh, limited, including from the bottom. So this middle two hole, these middle two holes are very ischemic. We're also having these two uh, blue holes on the side, which have the blood supply from the surrounding only not from, in the, from this cut. So this is a relatively non-ischemic uh, non environment. So we're trying to see if the scaffold loaded with different molecules, either are being by itself without any modification, so, or uh, SIS modified with DSLE, and or LX7 DSLE modified SIS, or SIS loaded, directly loaded with EPC, or SIS modified with different peptide loaded with EPC. So ultimately, we're trying to dissect out and see which molecule or which part of the whole device is playing the most important role in mediating some, uh, endothelial cell functions in this ischemic environment, diabetic ischemic environment. So first of all, we actually looked at ZDF EPCs. So this is the Zucker fatty rat. Uh, uh, diabetic fatty rat. So they have we isolated EPCs, and they actually show uh, we actually purchased this EPC from the uh, company. We're showing that that this EPC are similar to human EPCs in many ways, including those uh, expression of alpha V beta three integrin on the surface of these uh, ECs. And we're also showing that X sub seven can actually bind to this uh, integrin alpha V beta three on these Zucker fatty rat. EPCs, and this can be blocked by antibody of X sub 7 integrin. So this shows the specificity of this ligand interaction with the, uh, the cell. We're also showing that by having this ligand modification on the surface, the endothelial cells seeded, ZDF endothelial cells seeded on the scaffold can proliferate much better, attach better and proliferate better. Okay, this is the, the, the key data. So what you can see here is that a different time point from day zero, of the, the, the middle two holes of the very ischemic diabetic uh, wound, uh, day zero to day three, seven, 11, and 14. You can see the healing rate actually is quite remarkable. You can see from this uh, diagram showing the blue is a regular SIS, and the, the green and red are SIS functionalized with silly or silly with, uh, with DS, uh, X sub seven. So you can see that actually with this, uh, so both DSL X sub seven or DSL modified EVs are much better than SIS only in terms of healing rate. And also, if you're comparing EPCs loaded on different environment, different scaffold with or without ligand, you can see that the red, which is SIS functionalized with X sub seven DSL, is is able to improve the endothelial cell uh, function and improve wound closure. And also, if you compare SIS functionalized with peptide, and then with EPC or without EPC, actually you can see that with the EPC, with the peptide conjugation as a combination, you see a much better 
outcome in a hearing. All these actually are showing that X sub seven is uh, playing a huge role in modulating EPC functions. And you can see also here with the uh, IVIS to check the stem cells after transplantation, you can see at earlier time point with X sub seven, actually EPCs, even in this very ischemic environment, most of the cells would die very quickly. But the, EP, the EPCs are able to survive much better in the environment where X sub seven is provided. And then from histology of H and E and uh, Mason's trichrome staining, you can actually see from the wound length, the, the uh, X sub seven EPC groups are, or the X sub seven modified EPC groups and compared with SIS without modification loaded with EPC, is, uh, the length is much shorter. And also if you look at uh, epithelialization of the re regeneration of the healing, uh, so you can see that with the EPC and X sub seven as a combination, uh, the group has a, the most, uh, b the best outcome in healing. So by looking at certain specific molecules and expression of a collagen, for example, we're looking at angiogenesis, we are seeing a much, much higher density of vas new vessels in the group of animals with treated with the X sub seven cilia, their cilia and EPC functionalized SIS compared with SIS by itself. We're also seeing a much higher expression of a collagen one and three in the new tissue uh, in the groups so functionalized with the peptide and the endothelial cells. So we're doing more actually. And so burn wound actually is something that we're actively studying right now. So I, I don't want to overwhelm you too much. We're actually establishing the model. We're trying to see how we can use this technology to increase new vascularization for deep burn wound healing as well. And of course, there are many other potential applications too. For example, you know, how to increase the vascularization with the, any medical devices or larger defect devices for different tissues like bone, nerve, other tissues actually, uh, you know, there's a huge potential for us to explore how to apply this technology. So I'm gonna, spend the, my last several minutes to talk a little bit about the lab and the resources that we can provide to the department, especially to the young uh, trainees. And so we are actually, this lab now, with the, the great effort from everybody who has worked in the lab in the past decade, now we actually have really established this lab as a hub for innovation and education. We have, now we are providing training opportunities to many, many trainees from different levels including some faculty and residents and scholars and students from graduate school and med school. So, so we, we are very proud of this and we are welcoming more trainees. If you're interested in the, joining the lab, if Dr. Farmer can get us more lab space. <laughs> and, but we do have lots of expertise that can help the trainees to understand how to translate the technology into clinical application. We're having you know, the biomaterial manufacturing center, GMP or cell culture team, and also small animal models, large animal models, surgical models for different diseases. We're also really establishing a very collaborative environment. As an example, you know, we've been really closely working with different departments across the school of medicine uh, school and also other departments from College of Engineering and also the vet school. We're really proud the team science actually works so well in many of our, our projects and we're expanding the potential application to many other uh, diseases and indications too. So lastly but not least, and so we're trying to see how we can develop new technologies that can be translated from the lab, from the bench to the bedside and also the translation of this new technology into commercialization potentially. So with the Aggie Square, actually everybody is excited about the potential. I think you know having more people to be excited and enthusiastic about surgical innovation and and the invention and commercialization, this is going to be a, a huge deal for our community and for our for our, not just from UC Davis. As you can see, this is the older picture of a first uh, the first face of uh, of Aggie Square. I think you know with all the innovation work that we all at large our group is uh, doing now is gonna be a, we're gonna have a big impact in our ecosystem. So last slide, I'm gonna give a shout out to our uh, 
quarter of Aggie Square program that has been supported by the Pro provost office. So one of the programs that actually one of the first programs that got a, a approval from the provost office is the biomedical engineering team at the science camp on the science campus by looking at the collaboration between our department and biomedical engineering and several other medical departments, surgical department, ICU, to basically to provide training opportunities for undergraduate, BME undergraduate specifically here. And also to hopefully we can get some research workforce over here to know more about our medical research and help our research program too. So I think with that, I'd like to say as you, I'm hoping you are convinced that surgical bioengineering is making a big progress actually in uh, improving the patient care for different diseases and also the collaboration between the med school, med school and college engineering uh, school. Uh, so we were able to make, uh, develop new technologies and make many innovative treatments for human and animal patients. And also entrepreneurship invention and innovation is really exciting and it's growing fast. And with that, thank you very much for your atten attention. To take any questions. Well, Aishin, thank you very much, and I'm, I apologize for being late. I think you can see I brought the stem cell <laughs> delivery uh, device. We were just uh, training the OR. Dr. Hiroshi is going to be starting a clinical trial with one of the devices that you and we have uh, developed together. Some people have. It hasn't gone unnoticed that that's really a wine carrier. It's kind of a California version of stem cell delivery uh, device. And you can tell we're not a very sophisticated company at this stage <laughs> of the game, that's for sure. But, um, you know, I've been really proud of all the work you've done and really the collaborations that you've built with so many people across the department. Our plastics colleagues, our transplant colleagues, our trauma colleagues, our burn colleagues. There really are uh, so many. Uh, uh, Unlimited, um, uh, unlimited potential for the areas where tissue engineering and the kind of biomedical engineering that you do um, can have impact. And in fact, now you're collaborating on, uh, with some of our cancer colleagues as well. So I just uh, want to open it up for questions. And Manny says he's got a bunch from the audience there. We'll start with the audience for the first time, the video audience. Yes, we have uh, some comments and questions. We'll start with Dr. Ian Brown. His comment is uh, it's fascinating, specifically in trauma, ischemia, and reperfusion injury is a big and possibly underappreciated culprit in poor outcomes. EVs have been seen as a culprit in many cases as EVs released by ischemic gut tissue can potentiate pulmonary injury, for example. However, within the last few months, one group has been able to condition vascular endothelial cells to generate EVs that can protect cardiomyocytes from ischemia and reperfusion injury. Likely a ton of potential applications for vascular, transplant, plastics, and trauma surgery. Um, would love to see this ap applied in animal model of Reboa and vascular animos an anastomosis. Um, Oh, yeah, Good job, Missy. <laughs> uh, uh, and then Missy Humphreys, um, Dr. Humphreys asks, uh, when will this technology be available for us to try it in patients with diabetic foot wounds? Yeah, well, Dr. Ian Brown uh, made a great comment, and actually I'm aware of uh, quite a few new technologies around this EV for improving new vascularization. In our own lab, actually, I don't have the time to talk about that. Actually, we do have a subgroup who are developing EVs and engineered EVs for vascularization specific applications. So potentially we are currently actually working with the high limb ischemia model. We're interested in cardiac ischemia as well because the general concept really is that EVs by having all those microRNAs in, internally in the nanoparticles and also lots of proteins on the outside of the nanoparticles, they can really be engineered to mediate a new vascularization. We're seeing a pretty promising results. So for Dr. Humphrey's comment, actually, we are actively developing this, and we're seeing very positive results now. We're, I think we probably want to see you know, how this technology will be for a couple of things before we can really translate into the clinical situation. Uh, one is that from a product development perspective, how to 
really control the quality overall. And Finn says uh, all the components actually it's gonna be it's eventually for surgeons it's very easy to use, but from the product development there are quite a few steps that we have to we have to uh, work out. But overall, actually the preliminary study is very promising. And we're hoping you know with our expertise now in uh, you know interactions with the FDA and stuff like that, and also collaborators from uh, other uh, medical device development uh, enterprise. So we could potentially move this quickly. Hopefully, next step would be generating enough data to talk to the FDA from the regulatory perspective and getting approval. And we may be able to do some clinical trial f f uh, in the near future. Quickly probably means five years. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing how long uh, yeah. product development really does take in working with the FDA. One more? Dr. Greenhall asks, is an EV really a man-made virus? Do adrenal vi uh, viral delivery systems work as well? Adrenal viral. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. I don't know very much about that, but I'd like to know more. I think EVs are really, they're nanoparticles. You can consider their, them being a drug delivery, like a depot, so which can be applied into different things. And you can load different things inside. It's very versatile. I would imagine, yes, you can apply that to, to different applications, actually. I'd like to discuss It's a that. fascinating work, the issue of trying to deliver specific components to different specific areas based on attachments has long been, you know, the, the, the holy grail of trying to cure vascular problems without a, without a question. I, I just have a question of these EVs. The, uh, uh, is there a catalog of the naturally occurring EVs that exist in the body? I mean, is someone yeah. catalog that? How many are there? Oh, my God, there are a lot. <laughs> they're so small, and there are many, many. And every cell, all the cells, they can make EVs. So as you can imagine, there are many cells in the bloodstream. There are so many more EVs in the bloodstream, too. So many. I don't know if there's a number. Like so estimated. so is, the, is the primary effort to build your own EV or to find a naturally occurring EV? Right. That's a great question. Uh, so I think from naturally occurring EV, much research is ongoing about bio uh, biomarker discovery because different cells are making EVs and they are secreted. They're usually from biofluid, like uh, circulation, purple blood, for example. You can, you can identify those naturally occurring EVs, like cancer-associated or some type of cell-associated EVs by certain markers. You can actually potentially identify the source of the cells and so you know more about the, the yeah. disease. So that's natural occurring EVs. In our case, actually, we're interested in natural occurring EVs as well because they're so important for different indications like cells in ischemia, you know, cells at apoptosis. They're going to make different EVs. So we, we have ways to identify those EVs. Uh, you know, you can actually understand what what EVs are indicating what kind of situation. We're also more interested, actually, at this moment, with the limited manpower, we're more interested in developing EVs as a therapeutic. So you can control the culture condition, control the cell status, control the product, so they are empowered with the therapeutic potential for specific applications, but potentially both, really. All right, we'll go back to the video world, and then Dr. Raskin. So there's a couple of questions online, but uh, first with Dr. Brown, have you looked at scaffolding in irradiated tissues? Scaffolding in? Irradiated. Irradiated oh, tissues. Oh, ir irradiated tissues for irradiated uh, wound healing. Wow, that's a, yes, that's one of the topics that we have been discussing in collaboration with the, our radiologists, actually, collab collaborators, yes. So by promoting new vascularization, we're, the proposal actually we, we put in Oh, we didn't, but we were interested in writing R1 on that as well to promote endothelial cells in a very bad environment to to new, make a new vascularization. Yes, the answer, short answer is yes. We're Good. interested. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> more money, more space, more <laughs> lab residents. <laughs> yeah. So, Dr. Wang, what a fabulous talk. I just Thank want you. to congratulate you on this incredible work, and I'm Thank just you. spellbound by your, your discussion this morning. Um, any uh, EVs working in a dysfunctional way that have been associated with disease states? So I, I commonly see patients with Crohn's disease where they have just an inflammatory yes, dysregulation. Yes. And so I'm wondering, is that part of what you're looking at as well as the dysfunction? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. So as you, you can imagine, I mean, as we discussed earlier, all the cells are able to make EVs, and cells are different status and different stages that are making different EVs. So you can actually distinguish, potentially you can distinguish EVs that are made by dif different population of cells by looking at the surface marker expression, by looking at what's inside. So totally, that's very doable, especially now with the nanotechnologies that we are trying to develop if it's a collaborator for biomedical engineering. Basically, we're trying to analyze single EV. So we call it nano teaser, like Randy Carney is a professor from biomedical engineering. We're trying to understand how to use uh, those nanotechnologies to understand EV, like individually, one by one, analyze those. And it's like you are doing single cell sequencing. For example, nowadays it's very popular, very powerful for you to understand the heterogeneity and also the population, subpopulation of the cells in the body. We can also do the same for EVs, even though they're very small. Remember, they're only 100 nano, so very small, but it's doable. And it, I think this is a, there's a huge potential for expanding that research as well for bi biomarker discovery, for example. Back to the video world. Uh, Dr. Sean Adams asked, Aishin, it's so neat to see this presentation to learn more about the specifics of the studies you've been doing. Are folks developing coatings for tissues that are often the target of autoimmune attack, e.g. joint tissues? Could those spaces be coated with something that opposes inflammatory cell attachment? Yes. I think, you know, if, uh, I think if there's any collagen anywhere, we can easily mobilize certain molecules to that area. So basically by using like a, but any other, other ECM molecules can also be a specific target for binding or uh, conjugating or coding. The answer is yes, we can do things for that de design. We can design and coding for that specific. So I'm seeing a brainstorming session come out of this with some of these questions that have come up. You know, we've often had round tables from time to time yeah. with different departments in pathology and medicine to come up with ideas for certain technologies. I think there's a lot just within our own department for the kind of technologies, Aijin, that you're working on, yes. that we ought to put that together mm -hmm. and just have, uh, you know, maybe over a glass of wine or a cup of coffee in the <laughs> near future, <laughs> but really... Um, put some of these, because I, I could tell that what uh, Dr. Raskin is thinking of as a colorectal surgeon is could you line the GI tract of a damaged uh, person with uh, Crohn's disease mm -hmm. or some other inflammatory bowel disease and the question that Sean Adams asked. So let's, let's do it. Let's plan to get a bunch of people together to just uh, yeah. make a big list of diseases we need to cure. Absolutely. That would be fun. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Wang, for uh, all the great work you've done and pers on a personal level for the fabulous partnership we've had over the last decade. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you, everybody.